Hi, Ed Tillett here from Waterway Guide Media. Thanks for joining us. In the next 30 to 45 minutes, we're going to give you a great tour of the Atlantic Intracoastal Waterway, touch on the Gulf Intracoastal Waterway as well, and talk a little bit about navigating that stretch of water as well as preparing for your trip, whether it's your first trip or your 100th trip. We think we have some advice for you. So here's what we're going to cover. First of all, let's define the AICW. Next, preparation for cruising, provisioning, destinations, anchorages, some of our favorite stops along the way, navigation advice, tips, and then resources for planning. Waterway Guide was founded in 1947. We're proud of the coverage that we've done over the years. We're now producing over 20 publications in addition to mobile apps and web apps. So we've got you covered when it comes time to navigating and spending time on America's waterways. So sit back, get ready to take a look at what we have to offer, as well as listen to some of what our experts have to offer in this overview of the Atlantic Intercoastal Waterway. Thanks for joining us. What is the ICW? Broadly defined, it's about a 3,000 mile stretch of water that runs from Boston, Massachusetts all the way to Brownsville, Texas. It includes uh, all of the Atlantic Intracoastal Waterway and the Gulf Intracoastal Waterway. There's also a section known as the New Jersey Intracoastal Waterway up in the northern part of the United States. It comprises really two sections in the Gulf. There are numerous inlets that provide access to the Atlantic Ocean and to the Gulf of Mexico. It doesn't go between coasts, it runs along the coast. And and it's a fascinating history of American resources and planning. When you're looking at a chart or a map, you will see the Atlantic Intracoastal Waterway and the Gulf Intracoastal Waterway defined as AIWW, AICW, GIWW, or just ICW. In any event, however it's defined, and different federal agencies and different map makers use a different designation for it, it's the same stretch of water. For the Atlantic Intracoastal Waterway, it runs from Norfolk, Virginia at mile marker zero all the way to Key West, Florida, which is a distance statute miles of 1,243 miles. The last section of the AICW was completed in 1928 in Belhaven, North Carolina. That's why they call themselves the birthplace of the ICW. The ICW was designed to be 12 feet depth minimum, but it's not 12 feet throughout the entire stretch. In some areas, shoaling is evident. Uh, and it requires some sense of navigation and some sense of planning to get through those areas, especially if you're carrying a deep draft vessel uh, over four and a half to five feet. Dredging is ongoing throughout the ICW. You will see dredges as you move north and south in the shallow areas, keeping the depths uh, where they are navigable. Who uses the ICW? It's a multi-use resource for the United States. All along the Gulf, the Atlantic Intercoastal Waterway, the northern portion, everything from commercial vessels, wildlife, long-range cruisers moving north and south, weekend and day boaters, recreational fishermen, water skiers, personal watercraft, from jet skis, kayaks, canoeists. Department of Defense uses many stretches of the ICW for access to deep water and also for training exercises. So it's a multi-use waterway important to many, many communities. And many of the towns and cities along the ICW depend on recreational and commercial traffic for their livelihoods. Restaurants along the waterfronts, many, many marinas uh, that are positioned along the ICW. So the ICW is a great resource for the U.S. Okay, so you've decided to take a trip on the Intracoastal Waterway, whether it's for three days, for 30 days, or it's going to be your first trip from north to south or south to north. Preparation is important. Choose your mobile navigation apps, choose your navigation platforms, and understand how you're going to navigate the Intracoastal Waterway, wherever you may be. It's different navigating that northern section up through the sounds of North Carolina than it is the low country of South Carolina and Georgia and then eventually getting into Florida. You need to learn the rules of the road. When do you pass? How do you pass? Vessels coming this way, going that way. What are the aids to navigation? Get that information embedded in your navigational plan first and foremost, and it'll save a lot of questions and a lot of grief as you begin moving down the Intracoastal Waterway or up the waterway if you're coming from south to north. Many vessels that move up and down the ICW are shoal draft. That is about four feet, four and a half feet, not to exceed. That gives them more travel time uh, for those areas that are uh, low water. 
as far as mast heights go, we often get questioned at the boat shows. I'm getting ready to buy a catamaran and do the ICW. My mast is going to be 65 feet. Is that going to be a problem? Well, yes, it is. In some areas, you're not going to be able to get under those bridges. Even though those bridges are listed at 65 feet at high water, some of those bridges are settling and some of those bridges are not accurately at 65 feet. If you're a 50-foot, 52-foot mast, you're in much better shape for moving through all of those sections until you get down to Florida where some of the bridges are lower than that and you would have to go outside. We often get asked, what does it cost to do a long stretch of the Intracoastal Waterway, including marina fees, if you're going to dock for the evening. Uh, you can certainly anchor out every night and not incur a lot of fees for dockage. But at some point, you do want to come into a marina. At least that's our experience and our boats and the time that we've spent. You want to refresh the water tanks, pump out your holding tanks, perhaps take a shower off the boat in a nice facility somewhere. Dockage fees usually run about $2 a foot average. Uh, the farther south you get, the more crowded areas, the fees go up. You also may pay a nominal fee for electricity, and in some places you're even charged for water. Repairs are also a budgetary item that have to be covered. Something's going to happen to your vessel and you're going to have to get it worked on no matter how handy you are. We do a lot of work on our own boats, but at some point you've got to haul it out. You've got to have it cleaned. You may run into something. You need to get it fixed. So have some money in the budget for that. Car rental, if you're going to move between locations, you're going to have to have something in the budget for car rental. Of course, for food and provisions, and we're going to talk about provisioning later. So total up your costs based on what you think you are going to require for your comfort and your lifestyle and plan accordingly. Provisioning is an important component of any trip up and down the ICW, or any trip in a boat anywhere in the world. But along the Intracoastal Waterway, sometimes it's easier to provision, but this past couple of years with some of the issues with the pandemic, uh, it has not been quite as easy as in the past. However, solutions emerged quickly, and apparently they're pretty good solutions. I uh, have with us uh, Bob Shearer, who is one of our on-the-water cruising editors. Bob is known as Bob423. He's been cruising the Atlantic Intracoastal Waterway for many years, and as well as the islands and throughout the United States. Bob and his wife Anne and their dog Hooley are known up and down the ICW uh, as not only great proponents of cruising and enjoying the time on the water that they do, but also a tremendous amount of advice, which he's going to get into later in the webinar. But let's start with provisioning. Bob, welcome aboard. Give us some of the uh, issues that uh, you encountered uh, when the pandemic kicked in and how uh, you solved those issues for getting food, provisions, and, uh, and other uh, goods uh, and services uh, to your vessel. Yes, yeah, so we started the pandemic when we were down in Key West, didn't have a car, didn't want to get in, a, in transportation to go to the store, and Instacart uh, came up, as well as uh, another one called Ship It. And what they do is they charge a yearly fee uh, like $99 a year, and they will go do your shopping for you through an app, um, package it, and bring it to your boat, usually within um, two hours. In years past, during some of our webinars, we've talked about provisioning in general, before even the pandemic came in. And your advice, uh, as mine has been from the years that I've spent on boat, is don't over provision. If it's your first time going out, you may have a tendency to load up the vessel with everything that you think you're going to need. Uh, you're not crossing the globe. You have stops along the way. What's your advice on that, Bob? Yeah, the advice really is to shop about uh, maybe a week and a half in advance. Uh, if we're going along the IC, if we're at a place where we're staying for a while uh, and the grocery stores are within reach via Instacart or Walmart, shop at one week at a time. If you're going up and down the ICW, uh, you may find yourself inconvenienced by weather, and perhaps you want to think in terms of a one and a half to two weeks, but certainly no more than that. Have you found that uh, courtesy cars uh, are not as available as they have been in years past? Well, they're in certain places, um, and they're not as available. They're not uh, certainly not available 100% of the places on the ICW. Uh, so you make a list of ones where they are available, and you tend to go to those uh, first. And if they don't have it, uh, there's always Instacart and Walmart. Uh, Bob, you're going to join us back here in a few minutes. Uh, we're going to talk about navigation in the low country and some of the problem areas along the Intracoastal Waterway. Thanks for your advice on that. We're going to continue on with some other topics. 
be glad to. Thanks, Bob. Good advice on provisioning while underway. We'll hear from Bob again in a moment or so, talking about navigation advice along the ICW, some of the problem areas that he has charted. When we think of destinations along the Intracoastal Waterway, at Waterway Guide, we think of marinas, towns, anchorages, attractions, and events. Marinas can be destinations in and of themselves. Swimming pools, repair facilities, beautiful docks, uh, all encompassing. Restaurants, provisions, ship stores. Uh, You can stay at a marina for several days and never leave the property. Some of them are delightful. Towns, what can we say? Uh, Everybody has a favorite town along the ICW, and we're going to talk about some of those in a moment. Anchorages, some of our fondest memories are anchoring out for several days and spending time on the hook uh, while we take the dinghy back and forth to shore and enjoy the town or the marina, whatever it may have to offer. Attractions, plenty of those as well. Everything from museums, national parks, cultural centers uh, in the towns and cities along the Intracoastal Waterway. And then, of course, there's always special events when there's not uh, a pandemic. Wherever you may go along the ICW, you will find events uh, pretty much on the weekend and in season. So when it comes to destinations, you have plenty to do along the ICW. Every once in a while, someone asks, who are our favorite marinas? Uh, If they're going out for the first time, what marinas do we like the best? Well, there are thousands of marinas literally along the intracoastal waterways of America, starting all the way up north and running all the way around to Brownsville, Texas. But some of the ones that we've stayed at that we particularly like, and I've already mentioned Norfolk and Waterside, that's one of my favorite marinas, probably because it's in my home territory. I like the staff there. I like the way I'm treated and the proximity to downtown Norfolk. The Homer Smith Docks and Marina in Beaufort, North Carolina. It's a working shrimp boat dock, and it has new slips for transients. Harbor Walk Marina in Georgetown, South Carolina. New slips, and the town is fun to explore with plenty of restaurants. Isle of Hope, Georgia. Courtesy car is available to explore nearby Savannah, which we talked about earlier, and the guys at Isle of Hope are quite hospitable. Harbor Town Yacht Basin, Hilton Head Island, South Carolina. It's protected with plenty of amenities. I've always enjoyed spending time at Harbor Town. But as I mentioned a moment ago, there are thousands of marinas. I'm sure you'll find one that's your favorite. These are just some suggestions. Use waterwayguide.com and the Explorer to find facilities that you need for your vessel, whether you need repair, whether you want a swimming pool, on-site restaurant, and other details. We have about 300 data points in each of our Explorer listings for marinas, so I'm sure you'll find one that appeals to your needs and to your fancies. The adage that beauty is in the eye of the beholder certainly applies to this next category of favorite towns along the ICW. At Waterway Guide, we have a list of favorites, but everyone we speak with always has a favorite town as well. First is Mile Zero, Norfolk and Portsmouth, the downtown waterfront. It's a bustling waterfront. It's quiet at night, so you can usually get your sleep on board the boat, whether you're anchored uh, or whether you're at one of the docks or piers downtown. But Norfolk is a delightful stop. Uh, Plenty to do downtown, restaurants, culturally interesting museums close by, and the marina staff are always helpful. The next stop along the way is Bellhaven, North Carolina. We've mentioned them in the past as the birthplace of the ICW, a quaint little town in North Carolina that has uh, some fine restaurants, uh, great hospitality at the marinas that are close by. It's off the beaten path. It's quiet and historically significant. Washington, North Carolina, another favorite town, is off the ICW. You have to turn right if you're going south or turn left if you're going north. The waterfront docks have been renovated. It's a great little town to spend a few days in, tied up at the dock, uh, and the folks there have uh, a great attitude and quite hospitable. The same can be said about Beaufort, North Carolina, right on the ICW. Wonderful restaurants there, a good place for friends and family to meet. There are some bed and breakfasts and some inns close by. The downtown waterfront is delightful. Charleston, South Carolina, what can we say about that? Good southern hospitality, a bustling southern city. Uh, The marinas there are nice, Uh, other marinas close by, and you can spend several days in Charleston enjoying the historical sites and the restaurants and the food. And then Savannah, Georgia. Not far from that, Savannah, another delightful southern town. Uh, Marinas close by, enjoy the waterfront uh, along the promenade or go in, sit in the town square. 
Key West, Florida, enough said. Key West is another favorite town along the ICW, and uh, everyone who cruises there thoroughly enjoys it. But you may have your own favorite town, so get us uh, some reviews and get us the list of what you like along the ICW. But these are some of our favorites for all the reasons we've mentioned, but there are hundreds more. And while this webinar is focusing on the Atlantic Intracoastal Waterway, we don't want to leave out the Gulf Intracoastal Waterway, especially for those who cruise the Great Loop and end up in the Gulf or the GIWW. So here are some of our favorite towns from our cruisers at Waterway Guide. Apalachicola, Florida. Panama City, Florida, which is still rebuilding after some serious storm damage, but it's coming back quickly. Pensacola, Florida is a great stop. The Grand Hotel at Point Clear in Fairhope, Alabama on Mobile Bay is a wonderful southern town. Bay St. Louis, Mississippi. The marina there and the waterfront was rebuilt after a huge storm some years ago. It's really a superb destination. Slidell, Louisiana rebuilt their docks and that sleepy southern New Orleans town uh, about two or three years ago and you're not far from New Orleans. You can jump on the train or run over to New Orleans if you'd like. Madisonville, Louisiana to the west of New Orleans, another great little waterfront town we visited a while back. They have festivals and uh, plenty of boats on the weekend, just a delightful stop. And then Kima, Texas, of course, in Houston, plenty to do, great waterfront there as well. From Tarpon Springs to Fort Myers, you've got Tarpon Springs, Florida, Sarasota, and Fort Myers. All great stops along the Gulf Intracoastal Waterway. Put it on your agenda. And finally, in our list of favorites, Anchorages. Many folks who go up and down the ICW or who go out for a weekend or for a couple of weeks like to spend a few days on the hook. We've talked about that. Anchoring is a great way to see the natural flora and fauna of a particular region. It's also a great way to get away from the crowds. Find a quiet anchorage someplace and you're all on your own with the provisions that you brought and it can be a wonderful, delightful couple of days. But some of our favorite anchorages we've selected include... The Pungo River, North Carolina, at the southern exit of the Alligator Pungo Canal. Uh, I dropped a hook there several years ago. I particularly like it after coming out of that long canal. Uh, it wasn't very buggy. You do need to pay attention to which way the wind is blowing and how close you are to the marsh uh, based on the time of year. If you see insects around when you're getting ready to drop the hook, chances are, if it's at the end of the day, there'll be plenty of them at sunset. So pay attention. But I like that anchorage. It's protected and it's quiet. The Allendahl Creek in South Carolina between McClellanville and Isle of Palms Shallows is also another on our list, uh, provided by Bob Shearer. He likes that. And Bob and Ann have a uh, particular criteria. They need an anchorage that will provide them quick and easy access for dog relief. Hooli the Wonder Dog is with them, so they jump in the dinghy and take him ashore. Steamboat Landing, South Carolina. Crescent River, Georgia. Jekyll Creek in Georgia. Fernandina, Florida. Fort Matanzas, Florida, the Marine Stadium at Miami, Florida, and there are thousands more. Again, use waterwayguide.com and the Explorer functionality as well as our app to locate those anchorages that may fit your needs. There are plenty of them along the routes of uh, all of the ICW, places for you to drop a hook that's nice and protected. Back with us is Bob Shearer, who has spent many years navigating and transiting the Atlantic Intercoastal Waterway. There's some areas that are just delightfully easy and other areas that give you pause to cause. Bob, in previous webinars that we've done, we had about eight or ten big bullet points. Uh, let's run through those pretty quickly. Uh, I know that uh, uh, one of your primary bullet points uh, that you've used in years past is that the Intercoastal Waterway is wide in some places and it's narrow in others. What do you mean by that? Well, in some places, uh, it may even appear to be wide, uh, but the channels through that area can be very narrow and not so deep. About 95% of the ICW is easy, uh, wide, well-marked, no problem. Uh, it's the 5% you need to look out for. And for that 5%, uh, even if you're an experienced boater, uh, you want to look at the waterway guide alerts for that area because they will be up to date on what's happening there. Uh, right now, a couple of days ago, and we'll be updated by boaters going through that area. Now, uh, you have been a, a big proponent of, because your boat draws close to six feet, of choosing the tides to transit with, especially if you have a deeper draft vessel. Explain that if you would. 
yeah, uh, the, the ICW uh, was originally dredged at 12 feet. It's shoulder in many areas. Uh, but the tides down south are much more than what you might expect. It could be six or seven feet uh, worth of tides. So even if an area may be down to three or four feet at low tide, uh, you put in uh, five to six feet of tide and you get through it easily, even with a very deep draft of a vessel. There's vessels that uh, have, have eight feet of draft that go through there on a regular basis. They just play the tides. Gotcha. So uh, one of the advice um, um, paragraphs that you see throughout Waterway Guide and for those who transit is that if you have any questions, leave on a half rising tide from where you are and you know that you have at least those three hours that direction and three hours on the backside of it before you, you've got about six hours of transit, five or six hours of transit. Agreed? Yeah, right. Uh, you know, it's a, it's a curve that starts at three feet uh, for places down in Georgia. And you'll be above that, well, like you said, for a good uh, four to five hours. So you have plenty of time, uh, but you don't have it all the time. So you got to plan ahead to know when you have that uh, tide with you. Uh, your other advice, and I certainly, having spent the years that I've spent on the Intracoastal Waterway, is learn the markers learn the aids to navigation, know what those markers mean, pay attention, uh, get out in front of them, do your planning in advance, whether they switch, uh, whether they go one direction or another, where you have an intersection of a channel or an inlet. Uh, are there any particular areas that we should pay a special attention to? Yeah, let me answer that in two parts. On a typical day of uh, cruising, uh, you sit down in, in a harbor or in a marina, wherever you are, and you look at uh, where you're going to be in the next uh, 24 hours. You plot it out and note which um, shallow areas you come through and look at the water we got to work for those areas to bring up the speed and what to expect when you reach there. Um, and then on that basis, uh, you'll be ready for what's uh, happening uh, in advance. Now, in general, uh, going down uh, the ICW, there are a few places you have to look out for uh, year in and year out. And that's, for example, Browns Inlet, uh, Shallow, uh, and also uh, Lockwood's Folly and uh, New River Inlet um, and also Jupiter Inlet. Now there's a whole list of these uh, that are problem areas uh, that year in, year out, along with Mud River, are always problems to get through. And then, uh, of course, knowing your markers, knowing which direction is, is which, whether red on right, green on right, depending on the direction that you're headed. And that's clearly marked on the chart. So pay attention uh, well in advance. Uh, you mentioned um, that you've seen some boaters, and I have as well, who have a tendency to pay attention to their chart plotters uh, and uh, as if they're playing a video game as opposed to looking uh, out the window. <laughs> is, is that an issue? Uh, it is with some, uh, especially new members who uh, never cruised before, uh, may try to follow a track. And matter of fact, I publish those tracks, Bob, for two or three tracks. And uh, especially when I have kids on the boat, uh, they look at that track and say, my God, I'm going to repeat that uh, cursor right exactly in the middle of that track and don't look out where they're headed. You know, the track is a track. It's a guide. It's not a promise. Uh, and it's not a guarantee. So you have to look at uh, ahead of you, behind you, to the side, and then just note whether or not you're on that track or not, or on the route that you yourself planned. Uh, so do, do it that way. Uh, don't uh, ignore uh, what's around you. And of course, that brings up the question of the magenta line. What's your, what's your advice there? Uh, the magenta line uh, just tells you in general where the ICW is going. It does not show the deepest water. Uh, you got to pay attention to the charts. Uh, use Aquamap, uh, that has the Army Corps of Engineers surveys on them, or invaluable. Uh, use the Bob Fortress through track. Uh, but just the line itself uh, was put in place and not updated all that often. It is occasionally, and does not in general show the deepest water through the shallow areas. Matter of fact, in some of the shallow areas, it's deleted because it changes so rapidly. Right. So, but just the line is a guide, not a not a promise or a guarantee. You wrote a really good article on the effects of wind on the water depths uh, along the Intracoastal Waterway, and all waters for that matter. Give us the executive summary on that. Well, the rule of thumb is if you have an east wind, say of uh, 15 knots or even 12 or 15 knots of blowing for a while, especially if it's 20 or 25, uh, the ICW is going to fill up with water. 
Uh, you're going to get uh, half a foot to a foot more water than what you normally would expect from the tide tables. And the reverse is also true. If there's a west wind of 10 or 15 knots, and the longer it blows, the worse it is in terms of uh, making that delta. The water will be blown out of the ICW up to um, a half a foot or a foot, or perhaps even more. So a rule of thumb, east wind, more water, west wind, less water. Good advice. And uh, we're going to have a resource uh, uh, package at the end of this webinar. And there's an article that uh, you put in one of the Waterway Guide magazines wrote a couple of years ago on that. It's a great topic. Uh, finally, um, let's talk a little bit about AIS and VHF radio. Some, some basic advice here. Uh, do you have AIS on your vessel? Uh, yes, I have AIS. And I can see vessels uh, coming uh, at me that have their own transmitters, especially the big boats. Uh, and I also transmit uh, my own position so they can see me, which I consider very important. Matter of fact, just as important. I want them to know I'm, I'm there. Uh, so yes, I do, I do that on AIS. And it's very valuable, for example, when you cross the shipping lanes, like coming into Charleston or coming into an area, especially in reduced visibility. So I would highly recommend every boat should have that. Do you communicate with uh, commercial vessels from your vessel? Uh, do you ever hail them, uh, talk with the pilots, talk with the vessels themselves, give them your intentions, or do you just give them a clear berth and hope that they're paying attention to your transmitted AIS signal? Uh, well, normally I just stay out of the way. Uh, the only time I will give them a call would be if the tug uh, in a very narrow constrained area, like going through the rock pile, I'll call ahead and say, are there any, uh, even if I see an AIS, I'll say, are there any uh, tugs or, uh, or big vessels coming at me through a very narrow area and through any narrow area. And also for places like uh, doing dredging, you will certainly talk, uh, give them a call and say, which side should I pass on? Uh, on and actually any tug that's in a very constricted area. But for a place like Charleston, I just stay out of their way. I like that communication with tugboats, especially in the narrow areas. And quite frankly, the tugboat <coughs> operators are quick to answer. Uh, they get it. Uh, they appreciate it. Uh, there's no guesswork at that point. Are you going to pass on one whistle, two whistles, whatever it may be? And um, uh, I think that VHF uh, radio handling is an important skill along the Atlantic Intracoastal Waterway for that very reason. Bob, let's talk a little bit about, uh, you said some of the problem areas uh, that uh, we're publishing at waterwayguide.com and that you have charted and kept up with. We're working with NOAA, we're working with the Coast Guard and others to help them keep their information and data up, uh, up to speed. What is your advice for uh, preparing yourself for a trip uh, along the Atlantic Intercoastal Waterway? Again, whether it's five miles, 50 miles, or a thousand miles, or the Great Loop, in terms of the types of um, charting equipment that you have on your vessel. What's available today? What do you think uh, new users or even veterans should have on their vessel? Well, I believe every boat that's manufactured comes with a chart plotter. And certainly you keep the chart plotter up to date. Uh, but I, um, um, for my own personal use, I use an iPad, actually to use uh, two iPads, uh, one being Acromap, which has the uh, Army Corps of Engineers surveys on it. That shows you where you're at relative to water depth within a foot on a surveyed area. And also use uh, Navionics uh, for places where there's no uh, Army Corps of Engineer chart. Bob, a moment ago, we were talking about precaution areas along the Atlantic Intercoastal Waterway. Most of those are in the low country of uh, South Carolina and Georgia. Waterway Guide has taken uh, a big initiative in the past three or four years with uh, your leadership and guidance to develop a series of navigation alerts that contain a lot of information for those precaution areas. And they change from year to year, season to season, based on what has been dredged, what has not been dredged, what is silted in, et cetera. But we've come up with a formula. Would you walk me through a Waterway Guide navigation alert, how you arrive at that information, and what advice we're posting for navigating some of those precaution areas. Just give me a, a couple of good examples. Start with Daho River, for example. When they first did the ICW, they chose a route that was very uh, circulous and right through an area that uh, tended to shoal. And so what we did is look at a, a path uh, through the northern part of that river uh, that was always uh, 10 to 9 feet uh, without any shoaling, without any dredging. 
And uh, the waterway guy that worked for that area shows how to take that northern pass and bypass the uh, shoaling at the southern part. Noah has agreed uh, to actually move the Atons uh, to actually mark the northern path, and that will become the official path. And that was all due to what do we guide alert and the people who have taken that path to certify that it's fine. And also due to the fact that USACE um, verified that the depths were real. And we're going to have a new channel through there now that's going to save a lot of dredging money. Bob, at waterwayguide.com, you have posted a series of nav alerts over the past few years that comprise a, a series of overlays, uh, a series of tracks, routes, waypoints, new colors from Army Corps of Engineers surveys. Walk me through one of those navigation alerts and how I would read that if that's the first time I've ever seen one. Okay, let's look at the New River, for example. Uh, New River uh, has a lot of shoaling in it. A lot, a lot of the buoys sit in uh, shoal water. And what you will see when you see a uh, waterway guide alert uh, for that area, uh, in addition to some wording about how to navigate through it relative to the buoys, you will see a chart. It starts out with a, um, at the top, a verbal description how to get through the area um, by looking at buoys and how to follow a course. Uh, part two is you actually get a chart uh, from the Army Corps of Engineers that shows depths in one foot increments, and also a link at the very bottom of how to download a track for that particular area and follow it uh, to give a better explanation of how to get through the shallow spot. Let me ask you, um, in those charted areas, you have dotted lines, you have in some instances, you've put in waypoints. Uh, those are available via the GPX downloads that uh, you make available in the link through waterwayguide.com and out to your repository on your server. Are those GPX files downloadable to uh, all different um, chart plotters uh, or, or are they uh, uh, specific or proprietary to, uh, to a particular chart plotter or app? Uh, all chart plotters, all apps uh, will accept a GPX track. There may be details involved about just how they are downloaded and inserted into the app. Afro map and Navionics is very easy to do. Uh, for a chart plotter, it would be downloaded to a PC first and then uploaded to perhaps an SD card uh, or through a Wi-Fi app made by the manufacturer to the chart plotter. But yes, uh, all, all product types uh, can use those GPX downloadable files. Now, I think the important takeaway here is that you are creating those tracks and essentially going through those areas, marking the safe water or the water that's at a particular depth at that particular time, and then making those available through waterwayguide.com and through your repository of those tracks, those GPX files. So this is the route that worked for me. It ought to work for you. Is that an acceptable and appropriate way to define these? Uh, yes, let me just add one point to that. Uh, I always refer the depths back to mean low water. So if a person has a six-foot draft and mean low water is seven, he knows he can go through at low tide. If the mean low water is three feet yeah, and he's got a draft at six, he's got to wait for a three-foot tide to get through there. So it's a universal format uh, for a guy to look at the uh, actual depth in mean low water and figure out what he has to do and what tide he needs to get through it. All right, so in conclusion, Bob, uh, since you've spent so much time on the Atlantic Intercoastal Waterway, I think you have many of us beat. Uh, give me some tips for uh, folks who are going out for the first time or the 20th time. Uh, don't feel as you're, if you're on a schedule. That's the worst thing you can do on an ICW and say, I want to be at a certain place, a certain time, I got to leave. Well, if there's a 20 knot wind on your bow or 30 knot wind, uh, that's not a very good idea. So take, take your time and remain uh, flexible. If someone is beating you, for example, you have a friend that wants to go with you uh, partway down the ICW, uh, tell him what date uh, he get on the boat or tell him where you want to pick him up. But you can't tell him a date and a time. Time in the water is just not that predictable. Uh, the weather always changes. One plus on the ICW is that you always have cell phone coverage. Most places uh, do in fact have it. Marinas and anchors are more crowded uh, during migration, as you might expect. So you want to plan ahead. When going down to ICW, at least give yourself uh, two to three days 
advance uh, notice to make a reservation at a marina, for example. The most popular marinas are often full. If you come in at four o'clock, you may not get a spot. And hurricane season requires a whole different set of uh, concerns. And be alert for changes in plans and also places you may want to duck into if a hurricane comes close to you. Look ahead, plan ahead, and have that list ready in advance. All right, good advice from a lot of years uh, transiting and cruising on the ICW. I appreciate your time, Bob. Keep doing what you're doing. We're going to move on and provide some resources at the end of this webinar. I uh, look forward to seeing you and Ann and Huli on the water pretty soon. Uh, so thanks so much. We'll talk soon. Yes. Finally, here are some recommended resources. First and foremost, waterwayguide.com, Waterway Guide's Atlantic Intracoastal Waterway edition of the book. And that book is chock full of information that will provide you the background that you need. The Southern Edition picks up at the Florida-Georgia border and takes you all the way through Florida and down to the Keys and all the way around to Bay St. Louis, Mississippi. The Waterway Guide mobile app which has recently been released, will give you the same content on your mobile devices. The Waterway Guide Explorer at waterwayguide.com allows you to subscribe and give you the information that you need using internet connectivity. You should at least have one or two mobile navigation apps on your mobile devices. Waterway Guide recommends Aquamap. They overlay our data on the Aquamap mobile navigation app. The Navionics app is also another good app. iNavix is another good app if you're used to that interface. Weather apps as well. Understanding how to read NOAA forecasts is important. You can download their information for NOAA as well. The ICW Cruising Guide by Bob Shearer, and that has delightful advice for first timers out there in some of the hazard areas. So plenty of resources to do your planning. For all of us at Waterway Guide, this is Ed Tillett saying thanks for joining us. We hope to see you out there soon.